and it records the all audio. All right, so um, we can start. So we're team 7477 and we're here with uh, Zachary Tobias today, who is, we are interviewing different professionals in the industry who talk about the different job, different STEM jobs and their applications to FIRST. So I think you can start going around introducing yourself. So I'm Parth, I'm a programmer on team 7477. Oh, I'm here. Yug from Team Super Seven Seven Four Seven Seven, and I'm a new rookie member. Uh, and then hi, I'm uh, Zach Tobias. Okay, so um, if you could just start with just a introduction of your job and just a bit about what you do. Sure. Uh, currently, I'm working as a design engineer at a company called West Coast Magnetics based out of uh, Stockton, California. Uh, so we design and manufacture custom inductors and transformers, which are electromagnetic components that go on PCBs or circuit boards. Uh, and we meet uh, a variety of customers' uh, needs. So customers will come to us with a request uh, and we'll design a product and build it to their uh, specification. Uh, so my degree is actually in mechanical engineering, uh, even though I'm kind of working in more of an electrical engineering world. Uh, this gives me a unique perspective in the field, uh, since there are a lot of mechanical principles um, in magnetics that are used on top of the electrical theory uh, used to design the components. Uh, I'm also a FIRST Robotics alumni of Team 4135, the Iron Patriots, uh, located in Modesto, California. So that your like what your products sound really cool. Is there any like specific project that you're working on right now that you would like to maybe share a bit more about? Or sure. problem you can solve? It's a little hard for me to talk about specifics just because there's a lot of confidentiality with our customers. Mm -hmm. um, but I can kind of talk about some more general things. Um, so recently we had a customer come back to us uh, saying that an old part that we had designed for them was generating a little too much heat. Uh, which means that the temperature is going to be a lot higher uh, than they uh, uh, can use. Um, so I was assigned with figuring out how to drop the temperature rise. Um, I worked with our electrical engineers to create a design that we thought would improve on the previous one uh, and have a lower temperature rise. Uh, next, I created a SOLIDWORKS model of the old design and then the new design uh, to run some thermal simulations on in SOLIDWORKS' uh, thermal simulation program, SOLIDWORKS Flow. Um, it was interesting because this is my first real time using SOLIDWORKS Flow since college. Um, and I was just learning the program for the first time, which was pretty interesting. Uh, after figuring out the software and running some simulations, we decided that the new design would reduce the temperature rise enough so that the customer could run at full power. Um, I put together a presentation, sent it to the customer, uh, and they liked it enough to approve the design, and we've begun building it. Um, another project that I got to do more <clears throat> in line with uh, modeling and SOLIDWORKS is work with the extrusion tools, uh, the surface extrusion tools, a little more. Um, one type of part that we make a lot is wire twisted around a toroid, uh, which is like a donut shape. So if you kind of imagine a donut, um, wire would go in, in in the inside and out and around the outside and keep going like that uh, around the part. And that's a really common uh, inductor or transformer topology. Um, but modeling that can be pretty difficult. Um, so I found some stuff online and a YouTube video that showed a basic way of how to do it. And then I've kind of expanded upon that uh, so we could use that method uh, however we need uh, to make our data sheets a lot more accurate. Okay, great. And I think SOLIDWORKS is also like a tool that's commonly used in FIRST for like CAD and stuff. So, um, Yoga, would you like to start? With them? Yeah, so how do you see your skills like transfer into like uh, the field of robotics, like hardware wise and software wise? Uh, so for me personally, now not having a job in robotics, a lot of my experience or um, like opinion on this comes from my time in FIRST. But uh, I think a decent amount of the skills I've built up over my life will transfer pretty seamlessly to the field of robotics. Um, robotics is really where you have to marry quite a few different engineering disciplines to create a successful product. 
Um, so like I said, I have a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, so I have a good, decent mechanical in, uh, understanding of a lot of situations in robotics. Um, I'm in the process of learning uh, a lot of basic electrical theory that I can put forward. Uh, and I have some programming experience from college and high school as well. So I kind of have a little bit um, of everything. Uh, one thing I think made myself successful on the robotics team and many of my peers as well is we each kind of had one area of like expertise or being on a sub team that we liked a lot, uh, but having an understanding of what the other sub teams are also capable of. Uh, so on my team, we always had a joke of you can fix it in the code. So if the drivetrain breaks, probably a code problem. Uh, you know, if your climber breaks or an arm breaks off, one of the coders probably forgot a semicolon somewhere. Um, those jokes are really funny until they actually aren't jokes and people don't truly understand how their sub team or their piece of the puzzle fits in with others. Um, so I think that's one thing that first really helped establish for me and has helped me in my current job as well. So uh, I was mechanical. Yeah, the whole time. So I think freshman year, I was like the, the tool guy. Uh, we had like designated like one or two people to like manage all the tools. Uh, and that was interesting. And then my sophomore and junior year, I was um, on the mechanical team. And my senior year, I was like, uh, the mechanical team, like sub captain or, or sub head. So since like in different robotics teams, we have to communicate to maybe get a part or certain help in a code. How would you say like communication plays an important role um, when you talk and communicate with others on a day to day basis? Sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think in the working world, especially as an engineer, being an effective communicator is just as important, if not more important than being a technical expert. Um, a majority of my time is spent working with coworkers that are not technical experts in magnetics. Uh, so if I'm working with them on a project and I need their help explaining the problem and using a lot of technical jargon and including a lot of unnecessary detail isn't really effective or productive. Um, for example, if I'm sorry, yeah, if I'm talking to my manager or supervisor about how I'll need an extra day on an assignment or making a data sheet, um, just, you know, going on about the error that I'm having in SolidWorks doesn't really help solve the problem. He just wants to know, um, you know, the bare minimum so that he can make a decision on what needs to happen. Uh, another communication tool that I use a lot uh, at work that I learned from robotics is kind of the type of tone that you have when you talk. Um, so when solving problems, I try and have a very like calm diplomatic tone uh, to make people feel as comfortable as possible. Um, people aren't perfect and everyone's always going to make mistakes. So especially in a manufacturing environment, uh, those types are the problems that you're going to solve a lot of. Uh, so it's important to be understanding and focus on solving the problem ahead of you. Uh, and not really accusatory or, you know, accusing people very heavily of, you know, issues that they may or may not have created. It's not really your job, um, especially since on a robotics team, similar to in work, you want to get along with your coworkers or your teammates. Uh, and at least for me, when I'm more comfortable with the people around me, it generally makes my work a lot better as well. Yeah, so um, in order to be successful in robotics, we usually plan out many things like, for example, our code or to build our robot using CAD, et cetera. So could you describe how you like use intricate planning to be successful in your job? Sure. Uh, thankfully, a lot of my projects or designs only last like one to three months. Um, but within that time frame, plan planning is incredibly important to make sure we meet our customers' timelines uh, and deliver products uh, on the days that we uh, promise them. So for us, this means uh, selecting material for new builds that's in stock, has short lead times, and ensuring it gets uh, to our plant without being damaged. Um, for my own role, planning is really uh, important to not fall behind on projects since I often have a lot of projects that you know, only require a few hours of work every week. Um, so normally I try and plan out my week on a Monday, um, going forward for the rest of the week and then kind of plan my day by day activities the night before. So the last few minutes of me leaving work, I'll kind of jot down notes about 
uh, what I need to accomplish in the next day. I'll be honest, I'm not the greatest planner, so I am actively working on that, but I try and use planning tools like the task manager in Microsoft Teams. Uh, it has a really cool layout that's very similar to Trello, if anyone's ever used that with like a tile management system. So uh, it's really easy to keep track of stuff, but I normally just rely on a notepad and kind of write things down and, and cross them off as I finish them during the day. Yeah, so planning is like really important for us also because we have to plan like stuff for our meets like months in advance. And then you talk about Trello. Trello is actually what we're using this season. To, oh, awesome, for yeah. Schedules. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good question because probably based on the industry like expert that you talk to, your answer is going to be wildly different. Uh, so for me, actually, it's really important that our products are not made to be easily changeable or easily fixable, but that's by design. Um, in magnetics or in a lot of like mass manufacturing industries, there's a lot of variables that you have to control for and account for when you're making products. Um, for example, a lot of our parts go into medical devices or even implantable medical devices. So the FDA really doesn't like when you make sudden changes or anything because it'll restart a multi-year approval process. Um, so when we design our product, uh, we design it with tolerances in mind that will keep account for the variation uh, without needing to change the bill of materials or do any repairs to parts. Um, especially in high volume manufacturing, we really want as little change as possible. And we want the engineers to be like as hands off as possible uh, when it come when parts start going into that high volume. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the coolest parts, at least for me, about working and kind of another thing that I like learned uh, from first is uh, that in integration with like multidiscipline people is, is really interesting. Um, so for us, our engineering team at our company is on the smaller side, but a lot of the variation in skill sets comes from outside the engineering team. Uh, so it's interesting as a design engineer, I'm more on the front end of the business meaning I get the opportunity to work with pretty much every department in our company uh, when we're creating new parts for our customers. So on any design, I might get to coordinate with our customer service team for some issues. You know, maybe I need to get uh, the customer's proper shipping address or get NDAs signed or, or other documentation that's more upfront in the process signed. Uh, for our purchasing team, it involves making sure that our bill of materials are accurate uh, and that the parts we're ordering are in stock with the correct revisions uh, and being you know, made to th their data sheets. Uh, I get to work with our quotation department, which is really important to making sure that everything is priced out properly. We're giving the customer a fair price while keeping some margin for the company as well. Um, it's, it's really cool. Uh, and, and as well, I get to work with an experienced team of operators who are kind of our check for whether or not a new design is feasible or not. Since these people have multi years of experience uh, building magnetic components. So we use them a lot uh, for advice. So I wanted to add, I mean, like, there's, there's a lot of, um, of course, like you have to work with a lot of people within your company, but you talked about how you must build like a lot of products for other companies, like for example, medical companies. So do you like do they give you a job or do you have to also actively work with people from that company like on a day-to-day -day basis or is it uh, more like it, they give you give yeah you a job it, it really depends um so we've had some there's we generally have two types of uh uh projects we'll say so we have some where a customer will come to us with some electrical specifications and they want us to uh, create the design for them 
So in those situations, they'll kind of just give us some numbers. They'll, you know, tell us input output voltage, maybe what the current the operating frequency is and a few other things. And we'll design something that uh, meets their need and we'll send them a data sheet that shows them what the finished part is going to perform like and look like. Um, and then other situations we have like build per spec or build per print where the customer already has a design that they either um, got from a previous designer many years ago or that their own engineers put together, they'll send us the print. We'll review it, make sure that we can build it, uh, get all the items on their bill of materials and we'll build it to their specification. So those are kind of the two main types of, uh, of things. So in, in some situations, like if we're the designer, um, normally I'll kind of ask maybe some clarifying questions to the end customer. Um, so I'm working with them maybe once a week, depending on how difficult the project is. Uh, but on build per print, um, I have more of a constant line of communication with the customers just in case there are any issues that pop up on their print. Um, just to, to make sure that if you know they have an existing design that they're expecting that we're able to make it to 100% of their design. Oh, that's really tricky, honestly. Uh, it it kind of depends on the situation. Um, with colleagues, um, like I kind of mentioned before, I, I try and build up like some good personal connections with colleagues so that like if there is disagreement, I know the person a little more. It's a little easier to like work out that situation, like similar like you guys on the robotics team, I'm sure. Like, you know, if you hang out with your teammates or like you guys have classes together, you know each other a little more. And I think you're like almost a little more comfortable like disagreeing or going at it because uh, you know your friends at the end of the day still. Um, but if issues pop up with customers, um, it's it can be really difficult and it's very situational. Um, like I mentioned, like my approach is always being very diplomatic. So I try and focus on what we can do moving forward versus like any mistakes that have happened in the past. Um, and sometimes, you know, there are mistakes on customer side. Sometimes there are mistakes on our side. Um, I think it's kind of important to just take responsibility and then move on from there. Uh, yeah, quite a few actually. Um, <laughs> I think robotics is a pretty like good training ground for this on like how to handle stressful, stressful situations that are just like thrust upon you. Uh, currently I'm dealing with a few issues related to encapsulating a part in epoxy. Um, so if you have an existing part, sometimes you'll put it in like a plastic enclosure or metal enclosure uh, and cover it with epoxy and let it cure. Um, there's a few reasons why customers may want this for their design. Uh, generally, it promotes better heat transfer if there isn't any forced air. So if there's not like a fan blowing over the part, um, it gives it a little more volume to um, kind of uh, like have the heat spread out a bit more. Um, it helps with isolation between the primary and secondary winding. So making sure that the electricity isn't shorting in the component if it's a transformer. Um, so those are yeah some some of the reasons, but this encapsulation is really really tricky, um, and there's quite a few challenges. Um, the first is eliminating any air bubbles. Um, so if anyone's ever seen like those, uh, you know, people on YouTube that make those uh, resin tables where you have like a piece of wood and you pour resin over it to like make a really pretty product afterwards, um, it's very similar to that but sometimes the geometry of the parts are a little more complex. Um, so we'll often put the parts in a vacuum chamber to try and forcefully remove any air coming out. Um, but doing that, e e even with the vacuum chamber, sometimes it's difficult to remove all of the air. Uh, so that's one challenge that occurs because uh, the air, air is a really good insulator. So if there's any air in, in, in the uh, epoxy, it can like slow down the rate of heat transfer. Um, or the air can expand rapidly and cause the part to explode. We, we've seen that before too. Um, the next is that, um, you know, ensuring the epoxy doesn't change the electrical properties of the part. Magnetics are like really finicky. 
Um, it's, it's difficult to get them to work sometimes. So any changes to it um, can really cause issues. Uh, so currently the problem I'm running into is that as I'm starting to thermal cycle these parts as if they were in their operating environment, because, you know, when they're on the customer's board, they're going to heat up, cool down as the machine is turned on or off. Um, so what we're finding is with this part, uh, it's kind of the uh, epoxy is like permanently changing the electrical properties. So I'm spending a lot of time kind of figuring that out and um, yeah, trying to solve that problem. But like going off that, what, what first kind of taught me is that if you have a problem, especially one where you have a really big time crunch, I think the best thing that you can do is kind of take a deep breath and think about things like slowly and calmly. Cause I'm sure you guys know, like if something breaks in a competition and you're running around trying to fix it and like, you know, doing everything as fast as you possibly can, you're probably going to break something else on your robot instead of solve the initial problem. Uh, so the same thing, is, it goes for work as well. You know, if you have a problem, it's best to kind of write out, you know, what you're doing, what you're working on and the possible solutions going forward. So you don't waste any more money, time uh, or effort. I think what you said there is like really important because we have like a zinc called that this season and one of our meets, like our, our mechanism that took, um, I don't know. Have you seen the FTC game this season? Um, I, I saw you guys' robot, but I, yeah, haven't, so, I don't know the full competition. I know roughly what it does. So, yeah. So, we have, like, an earlier robot where you take a cone from one side and then, like, switch it to the other side of the robot. And that part, like, a major part of that broke. And we were, like, running around trying to fix it. And we didn't even, like, pay attention to other changes we were making. And then the next match, that worked. But then our claw broke. So, then the whole tournament was just different modules breaking. And because we didn't, like, approach the problem, like, one step at a time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think situations like that are are really stressful. Like kind of calling on my own uh, experience. I remember there is a in uh, I think 2017 the FRC competition with Steamworks, um, which in that competition there was a climber aspect of the robot. So there was a rope that hung down, uh, and your robot would climb up this rope and then press on a goal. Uh, and if it pressed long enough, then you would get the points. It was in the the end like fi last 15 seconds of the match, something like that. Um, but we had a few, two times uh, we were using a VEX gearbox and our planetary gear, the, the sun gear actually sheared, the weld sheared completely. So we had to take it apart uh, and replace that gear ratio twice in, in our finals matches. Um, and it was really, really stressful. But I think one thing that helped is our, our coach was like very good about kind of calming everybody down and just making sure that we approach the situation correctly and we didn't make any rash decisions. Okay. And then one more thing I want to talk about is, uh, of course, you're like um, experiencing first. So like, did, the, did you think that like gave you any advantages when you were maybe applying to college and when you, when you went to college and like maybe even transferred into your job? Do you think that gave you an advantage over other people like your when you went through first? I know you touched on this, but just maybe. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to say absolutely if that, you know, made any bit of the difference or not, but I think I felt a lot more prepared and first, um, like even for, you know, job interviews, like doing stuff like this or uh, presentations and work or um, the, the conference where we met APEC, you know, that that the whole thing is about, you know, customers or potential customers will come up to your booth and kind of ask you, you know, give you ask them to, you know, you give them a little elevator pitch about, you know, what your company is, kind of what your capabilities are. I think a lot of those skills I learned in first when judges come up to your pit during competitions, asking questions, you know, you have to give presentations to your community about, you know, what you do. Um, I remember I did a lot of that in robotics and it kind of just like hammers how to kind of talk like that uh, into you and like, what are the main points that you want to hit on? Um, kind of like, yeah, expanding on that. It's like, you know, making sure you only tell relative information. So, you know, if you're presenting to, you know, a community member, or a community organization, they probably don't care as much about all the little technical nitpicks. They probably are more interested in your overarching, you know, reach in the community and kind of what you guys do for high school kids and how you propel them into college. So um, stuff like that, I think I really learned in first uh, and kind of helped me when it comes to job interviews or just, you know, doing well in school. Okay, so Murnal, do you guys have any other questions or?
That is a really good question. Uh, I think I touched on it already, but I think, yeah, the biggest thing I took away from first is like understanding that you sometimes are just a piece in like a much larger puzzle. Um, I think that helps a lot at work too about kind of, not that I'm an expert at this yet, but kind of understanding where your responsibilities end and someone else's responsibilities begin. Um, I think this will make you like a much better coworker. Um, and it'll make you like much more successful because you won't waste as much time kind of doing things that you could be relying on other people to do. Uh, and this goes for college as well, especially in group projects of like, um, you know, also in robotics, I'll, I'll say two points that I'm, I'm cheating. Um, it's like delegation. You know, if you're the captain, you can't do everything. You can't build the robot by yourself. And it's like very evident of that, but that's what you have a team for. You know, that's what you have sub captains for. So it's like learning the delegation tools of like making sure that everyone kind of has a role really helps a lot of group projects and will help a lot in work as well. Okay, thank you. So I think that's it for us. And I just wanted to, or Bernardo, do you have a question? Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to say like, touch on where we met, like we met at the APEC conference, of course, in, mm -hmm. in March, I think. So, or yeah. So it, I think that touches on how important it is for um, FTC teams to like get out in the community and like, attend events like this because like we met you through this and we were able to learn a lot from you so i think it that's another important aspect of first everyone should be going out in their community and you can meet like a lot of different people and learn a lot of stuff mm -hmm. from them yeah absolutely so, um thank you for coming on i think that's it for us today so again thank you yeah no problem thanks for having me it's really awesome yeah.